sorry for the abrupt beginning, but as you know, Mr. Cooper is calling in, and um, that time is set in stone. So we want to ensure that he has as much time to speak as possible and uh, maximize that communication. Um, on behalf of the San Francisco Law School uh, NLG chapter, um, we'd like to first thank all of you for coming out here on a Friday night. Um, we'd also like to extend our gratitude to the Hastings chapter of the NLG uh, for, for letting us this fabulous space and being so hospitable. Um, I want to point out that it's the solidarity between law students and workers and allies that makes the National Lawyers Guild a formidable force in fighting for human rights. Um, and lastly, I want to thank you, uh, Richard Chen, um, my friend and colleague, who spearheaded this panel and uh, made it a reality. So um, on that note, uh, I'm going to pass the mic on to him and uh, we can begin. Um, thanks a lot, Serena. Um, so I'm going to be moderating this panel tonight and uh, I'll start out by saying a few words about Kevin. Kevin Cooper is a man who this year, uh, 2015, will have spent 30 years on death row for murders that he didn't commit. He was charged and convicted of the brutal murders of a white family, the Ryans, in Chino Hills in San Bernardino County in 1985. You can see some of his paintings on the wall behind me. Uh, there's one over there showing dolphins jumping in the ocean in the sunset which I find quite ironic, unfortunately, since I understand that even though he has been in San Quentin for decades, he never gets to see the ocean. I've worked with Kevin's defense off and on for five years, and it is very difficult. The legal defense has been frustrated on many occasions, and we have trouble with the political defense, too. So I want to talk about some of the problems that I've encountered. When I was first introduced to Kevin's case, I read Scapegoat, uh, the book by J. Patrick O'Connor, which is available for sale on that table over there. And I also read The Ninth Circuit Descent all the way through. It's a very complicated case. And then I went out into the world to campaign for his freedom, and there were two types of problems that I ran into. The first is when somebody who knows a little, about, a little bit about the case says, well, as you know, this is a really brutal murder, and the man got his DNA testing. He got the testing, and it came back, and it showed that he was guilty. I mean, do you really want me to believe that somebody in the San Bernardino Sheriff's Department actually planted Kevin's blood in order to frame him? I mean, come on, right? <laughs> and some of the people who say this are actually people that I respect. It's worth saying. Now, um, we all know that there are innocent men and women on death row. I read an article recently by Rodolfo Acuna which estimated that one in eight are innocent. But one in eight is not everybody. And the nagging question that you get sometimes from people is, well, how sure are you, really? Another kind of response is, yes, there are all these innocent people on death row, um, the mass incarceration system is horrible, and we need to do something about it. Well, good luck. <laughs> and the question there is, life is hard, everybody has a lot of stuff going on, and how important is this? Why should I care about this man and this case? So I want to try to address these questions. First of all, the judiciary itself is split on Kevin's case. When the Ninth Circuit denied Kevin's habeas petition in 2009, they split almost down the middle. 11 judges on the Ninth Circuit dissented from the denial. One of them, William A. Fletcher, declared in his dissent that the state of California may be about to execute an innocent man, and he said in a lecture that Kevin Cooper may well be, and in my view probably is, innocent. And he is on death row because the San Bernardino Sheriff's Department framed him. Secondly, Kevin maintained his innocence from the very beginning, and his trial took place in an atmosphere of extreme racial prejudice. You can see this picture up there, uh, which is a picture from his trial, where people hung an ape in effigy in front of the courtroom uh, with a sign saying, hang the end. 
there was another sign that said, hang the African troglodyte. I haven't been to San Bernardino County myself, but one of the things you should know about it is that they have a lot of white supremacist and neo-Nazi groups down there. Major organizations like the Aryan Brotherhood, Aryan Nations, and the White Aryan Resistance have many members in San Bernardino. The Nazi Lowriders, which is affiliated to the Aryan Brotherhood, have about 400 members there, and there are major skinhead organizations like the Hammerskins and also Volksfront. They had addresses in Chino Hills where the murders Kevin is accused of took place. And this is important to understand because it's been proposed that Lee Furrow, who was a member of the Aryan Brotherhood along with two other members, were the ones who actually killed the Ryans. But even if you set that aside, when you consider the issue of evidence tampering and destruction, you ask, well, why would the police do that? Well, one answer I propose is that Kevin's case is a legal lynching which took place in a climate of entrenched white supremacy. There were, and there are, careers built on killing this man. And why you should care about it is, maybe we don't like racism in San Bernardino County. So I'm going to uh, turn um, the mic over to the panelists. Our first speaker is Amir Barak Ahmed. He's an organizer with All of Us or None, and he was wrongfully sentenced under New York's Rockefeller drug laws. And I'll let him explain what that is. Hello. Thank you, everybody, for coming. First, let me say that I'm honored to be here to bring up issues of this racial disparity, the racial injustice that's here in America. As you said, my name is Amir Varek Amo, and I was sentenced to 25 to life for nonviolent, non sexist crime, drug laws, drug wars. The fact of this matter is, my being incarcerated is part of the larger system of systemic oppression that we all face, whether we recognize it or not. But before I get in my spill, I need everybody here, everywhere I go, I need everybody here to recognize the three things that we should tell everybody around us. We have people with lawyers here, so that means you will have five individuals that you will be influenced under. You have family members, you have everything else. We need everybody to get involved. But we first need everybody to recognize the reason why you're here is for your civic responsibility. You gotta leave this place in a better condition than you found it. If you go into a house, you clean it up. You don't leave it there, right? You, you clean everything up. Right now they got poop scoop laws for the dogs and everything else. You clean things up. So your civic responsibility, you should know what it is. And it can advance in so many levels, in so many areas. But as you do advance your civic responsibility, you will come into one of these things called peer pressure. Peer pressure is definitely in the streets, it's in the gangs, but it's definitely in the courts. It's definitely in all these racial segregated <coughs> industries that's out here in America. The peer pressure is negative, but it's up to each one of us to have that peer pressure positive. You know, you can tell the person next to you something positive. I have one of my comrades here, anytime I get stressed out, he tells me something positive. And that's positive, that's peer pressure. Like, yeah, I gotta do good, cause he doing good. I gotta do good, I gotta do better than him. All right, and the last thing we have to recognize is we have to change this dominant narrative. In the media, every time you have a face, the face is somebody evil. The face is somebody that is wicked, somebody that is criminals, et cetera, et cetera, but the face always looks like somebody like me. So people have this, preconceived notions that this dominant narrative give. So, like I said, I spent 20 years incarcerated under the Rock and Roller drug laws. I was sentenced to 25 to life. And the only reason why that I'm here today is because the super rich stole so much from America that other people had to say, Dad, we had to do something. So they decided to let people out that was incarcerated across the nations. There's no one had no good feel about it. It was economics. It was money. And it was the evil people in this colonist, in this capitalist society that continues it, that perpetuates this thing. It's the economic prosperity and it simultaneously increases the racial oppression, which equals, i.e., rationale. The rationale of America comes through the media propaganda and definitely political agendas. That fills everything up. As Robert said there, there is so many evidence for Kevin Cooper's case. I was trying to fight for the last individual that I was with in, in, in Atlanta, Kevin, um, um, Troy Davis. There were so many avenues in these cases as death penalty, but the propaganda and the money that's spent, we don't have that equal fight in power, but we have the masses, and the masses need to speak up. My sentence, 
I used to ask myself and ask uh, a lot of psychiatrists inside prison, how do I do 25 life for something I didn't do? Like, how could we even conceive sending an individual to a prison to a nine by seven for so many years? I was tortured and beat up by the police. I couldn't walk, I couldn't eat for over six months. And I was like, wow, like, for what? They wanted me to tell on somebody personal interest. I'm like, yo, your office, do your job. Don't, why you have me involved with it? And, but they beat me up so much, they had to concoct the story. During the trial, the trial only took place for me maybe eight hours. The most of two days here, I mean, eight, four hours, four hours next. And boom, gone. I had my so-called grand jury minutes was given to me 10 minutes before trial. But I don't know the law. I had two, three lawyers because I was like, yo, you're not doing this. I know something's wrong. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. I kept writing people for help, writing people for help. But the major media was like, yo, you're in for drugs here. Yeah, okay, you did that already. So I couldn't reach out for no help because that dominant narrative was these guys is already guilty. The war on drugs, the war on black people, the war here is keeping racial segregation going at all time highs today. Today I can equate being living in America in the 1890s. It's so crazy. Again, legalized lynching, that's what the death penalty is. If you had so many, uh, let me stop, let's just get, let me go back to this topic. So, with this legal propaganda, there's so much money spent for these evil people. I'm gonna give you some statistics. Just at the base pay, the United States is spending $80 billion for incarceration yearly at the start. 80 billion. What could we do with $80 billion, huh? How much does it stop homelessness across the United States? They say 20 billion. I say it's way less because in every major city, I drove from New York all the way over here, in every major city, I see major, big, abandoned buildings that they can transform into housings for the people. But no one's having that propaganda. Right? To keep me incarcerated for that one, for them 20 years, New York spent $1, billion, $1 million to keep me incarcerated. Now, what could I have done with $1 million? I could have went to England, went to Oxford, got my degree. Hmm? Come back, start a small business. Hmm? Hire seven people, right? Buy a house for $230,000 and still give the state over $200,000 in taxes. Huh? That's just me, one person, $1 million. But at that time, New York had over 30,000 people locked up for nonviolence. And we ain't even gonna talk about across the nation. How many millions there, the waste of lives. I just found another thing, talked to somebody else. I didn't even know that here is the largest people that we, sisters, women, that's on death row. Wow. For the last five years, the system and this propaganda have been increasingly incarcerating women and youth. The same evil propaganda that they did with me back in the 80s and 90s, they're doing it now to the children and to the women. So that's why it's so easy for them to try to had these legal lynchings and have all these people on death penalty, on the death row. As you say, he's been there for 30 years and never seen the ocean. Can y'all really imagine that? Huh? Can y'all really imagine being in a place smaller than your bathroom for how many years? Can you imagine that you don't have no peace 24 hours a day? So his peace is these paintings. He's formed his own world, but we don't listen. Then after you torture these individuals, you're like, well, we really can't let them go because he's going to wreak havoc on society. Again, media propaganda. We don't talk and look at nobody as humans no more. The United States left humanity for hard currency. The United States left humanity for hard currency on every facet. When I thought I was coming out, I thought this was going to be a nice place. San Francisco, Hollywood, oh, I'm here. But the homeless situation around here and the money that is being spent on nothing is ridiculous. And then now we're here trying to save a man's life and we don't have as much people. You know, I'm, I'm glad that everybody's here, but this room should be filled. I sent out blasts on my Facebook and everything else. People are like, yeah, yeah, we heard about it, yeah, we heard about it, but no one takes that extra time to do that extra push. Remember, civic responsibility? That little extra push to do the right thing. Because you might have to say something different than it's not the dominant narrative, but you want to stand your ground because you know it's doing the right thing. I'm sitting here, I'm talking here, and everybody here, I'm trying to get a lot of people's numbers because I'm going to do some positive peer pressure with y'all. I'm going to be like, yeah, we need you. I need you. 
My group is called All of Us or None. That means I can't do nothing without you guys. And it's vice versa, because this building wasn't built with one person. And just like Mr. Cooper's in prison, he's not in prison just for one person. It's a whole systemic process of oppression that's based on racial segregation for profit. Capitalist society. Everything starts with the capitalist society here, because now we left that humanity. And if you leave humanity on everything, then it's easy for you to be desensitized for everything. So when you see something on TV, it must be right, it was on Fox. Right? Everybody, it's good. Fox is the major brand. Everybody listens to Fox. I don't. And the individuals that do, do this peer pressure, the positive peer pressure, if you ever talk to them, they don't listen to the mega media outlets. They don't pay attention to none of that. But they are abreast of everything that's going here in society. Why is that? It's because they still have their humanity and don't care about that hard currency. I mean, you care about for some good. You gotta fight the system. But the system tentacles goes so deep that when you're really thinking that you're taking two steps forward, you're taking like four or five steps back. Again, think. How does it <coughs> feel to sleep in your bathroom for 20 years? Huh? Could you imagine sleeping in your bathroom for 20 years on a mattress about this big? We ain't gonna talk about the food, all right? That's number one. We ain't gonna talk about how much harassment they get from these prison guards who think they are actually God's gift because it's closed doors and they're torturing this man and everybody else in the walls. I can just imagine, I can't really imagine, why well, I just found out that we have so many women on death row, what they're going through. Because I think so much, so more ahead of time when some guys like me, I just you know, I used to just be crazy and for the here and now, do something violent, not think, but now I'm thinking. And when you get inside this prison system, you start thinking, you start wondering why logic is not here on every avenue. I used to go to the site inside and ask the site, hey man, how am I supposed to do this 25 years for something I didn't do? Like for drugs? Like even if I did have the drugs, like how am I supposed to do life? Like the son of Sam killer, this guy, you know, not to say he's bad, but he did kill eight people, nine people, you know, all right. But I am on the same level as him. But this guy, so I'm saying, he still has a lot of humane people talking about him right now. So he has a little network. And okay, that's good. If he's going to do right, if he's going to pay for his time, and he wants to fight for humanity, good. Everybody deserves a second shot. Everybody deserves to be there in the forefront to fight for what they believe in. Kevin Cooper needs help from everybody to fight for what he believes in. I believe, and I don't know his case, but I know they probably offered him something some other time. He was fighting for it. My case, they offered me two to four years. Then he went down to one to three. Then he went up to three to nine. I said, yeah, I didn't do it. Why should I take it? You better take it. I didn't do nothing. I'm going to go to trial. This is America. I, I believe in the system. Ha ha. <laughs> right? So I got a whole new way of looking at everybody and everything. I sit down and just analyze, 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 analyze. If you don't say certain keywords, I'm already gonna put you in that area of those racial bigots. Now, sometimes a lot of people in society don't know, you know, I gotta be realistic. A lot of the white people, y'all don't know that y'all train racists because that dominant narrative. If you continue to believe in that dominant narrative, you're gonna follow whatever that dominant narrative tells you to follow. So when they put this picture of Kevin Cooper up, you know, they the black eye braids. Oh, he must have did it. Huh? but we don't never look into everything in the case. We don't look at the A, B, C, D, all the way to Z, and then we don't ask, our, hey, what, what do you think about this? Huh? What, what do you think about this? Huh? So let's all of us come to a conclusion. But if everybody comes to the conclusion, they're all getting paid for the same thing, they're gonna come with that same con conviction all the time. Kill him, kill him, kill him, kill him. And first of all, how the heck we get to a nation that wanna kill everybody? Hmm? Like, seriously, how do we allow this? If we can spend $80 billion on prisons, half of that money can go to the United States and stop every disenfranchised community there is or slow it down. Crime has not been part of United States history. 20, 30 years ago, there was no boom in prison system. There was no boom in death penalty. But now there's a boom. And it's a shame that majority of individuals that's incarcerated happen to be black and brown. It's a shame that these black and brown people don't have the money to fight for their case, for so-called justice. Land of the free, right, huh? Equality, huh? Yeah, right? No. Just look right here on Market Street. Look at everybody who's sitting down the streets. They don't look like everybody that's over in these politician spots. They don't look like all these tech people. They look like me. Why is that? 
are they that evil? Are they that criminal? When I came home, I went to school, and I was still homeless, and I kept over 3.3 GPA. Who, oh, you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, Yamir, it looks like you did this paper right before class. Do it over. Why would I? Yeah, I did it right before class. I gave you 16 pages right before class. I got to be, no, I'm not doing that over. Why? People have so much preconceived notions that once you speak out of something that's away from that dominant narrative, you got to be wrong. But why is that? That's where you come check your civic responsibility. This is where you come check your family, your mom. Hey, mom, why you talk me like this when it's like this? What, what do you, you say in a nice, respectful manner because you want to get their answer and you want to change their mind. You want to change this dominant narrative. So you do it in a political fashion. Sometimes we can't curse everybody out all the time. I'm my big brother here, but we do things and we get it moving. So I'm glad that everybody came here. But I'm also asking everybody to do just a little bit more. I'm asking everybody to talk to five people to get them involved. How many of y'all on the internet? Raise your hand. Hmm? Just about everybody, right? How many of y'all do the social media thing? Raise your hand. Come on, come on, raise your hand. All right. Oh, eight How many of y'all said something about this? Oh, hands ain't really a lot. See? There you go. Let me ask y'all a question. Show of hands. How many of y'all know your neighbor? Left and right side of y'all. All right, good, should be everybody. Because I ask that question, people say, what do you need to do? Know your neighbor on your left and right side. Get back to community. Once you can get back to community, when somebody says something, they, no, nah, that's on me, he ain't do that. They, no, nah, he ain't do that. I don't care if you got a picture of him doing it. Let's go to some tech people and see if this picture's for real or not. Let's ask him, what's his proof? Instead of having the major media do it. And that's what the major media is doing to everybody on death row. As I said, the last case that I worked on was Troy Davis. Everybody that was on his jury, except for one, recanted and said, no, they didn't show us this, they didn't show us this, they didn't notice this. Everybody, even some law enforcement was like, yo, and they still executed him? This system doesn't even, not only affects those that's incarcerated, we find out that it affects all of those family members that's incarcerated. When I was incarcerated, my mom's lost her house. She's in the street right now from this incarceration. No one thinks about that. I grew up, my children didn't know me, so my children could go crazy because they didn't have a positive role model. No one's thinking about that. But they're thinking about all the things of political agenda. I'm a DA, I have several hundred victories. Yeah, I'm, I'm good. But out of that 700 victories, only one was really warranted. That's wrong. So again, I call everybody here to recognize the three things that I know will work. One. Thank you, you're here. So y'all starting with your civic responsibility. But two, peer pressure. Y'all that's in the lawyers, that in, that's in here, we need you guys to talk. We need you guys to put that paper. Call me, I'll get to your lawyer. I'll get to your doctor. Hmm? Whoever you get, I'll get in your class. And I guarantee you I will have changed one mind by that positive peer pressure. And the last one is you have to change that dominant narrative. You guys as lawyers, so y'all got to bring this argument, bring this rationale to the courts to try to get them to say, hmm, then the lawyers guys got to hook up with guys like me so we can try to bring more people to the streets, into the courtroom so people say, hmm, because that's how we change things. This is supposed to be a nation of the people, but is it really a nation of the people? No. It's a nation of the rich, it's a nation of the people who's ignorant, and the racial disparity is growing, and it's growing, and it's growing. And the thing about racial disparity is, even if these crimes are committed and you automatically incarcerate someone who is black and brown, that means the real perpetrator is out. That means there's no closure. And that's what white America has to recognize. You will never get no closure if you don't do nothing justice for everybody in your community, for everybody in the United States. The money that we're spending to kill this man, the money that we're spending for mass incarceration, just a small portion of that, if we allocate that back to those disenfranchised communities, we will be a society again. So, I implore y'all to do everything. I'm here. I'm gonna come talk to some of y'all. My comrades is here. Give me your numbers. I got a name. I, you know, I know attendance, attendance is going around. So give me your name and number, and I will guarantee you get in touch with you. I don't know what we can do together, but we can do something together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leo. Next panelist is Noam Hayal. Noam is Kevin's attorney. Um, he was a partner at R. Carrington and Sutcliffe for 30 years and uh, is now senior counsel. 
Uh, he has served on the Ninth Circuit Advisory Board and chaired the Judicial Advisory Committee for the Eastern District of California for three years. He was a lawyer representative to the Ninth Circuit Judicial Conference for three years and served for three years on the Ninth Circuit Judicial Conference Executive Committee. Um, and I don't know if I mentioned this already, but he's represented Ken since 2004. No. Thank you, Richard, uh, and thank you all for coming. And I want to introduce Tom Parker. Uh, if any of you saw uh, the Death Row Stories episode on Kevin's case, the two uh, faces you saw on that were Tom's and mine. And uh, Tom is here. We had a, uh, some work today in the, in the Bay Area, so Tom is here. So he does what he does for Kevin for free, as to why and uh, as to all the people who work for Kevin. And uh, he does a terrific job, and everyone is, and we're doing our best. So uh, let me also uh, say I'm going to try to shorten what I was going to do because uh, there's a lot of facts here and we have 30 years of facts and legal proceedings. But let me just talk much more about the crimes and what happened. And you can draw your own conclusion from the facts as to whether Kevin is innocent or not. Sometime before midnight on Saturday, June 4th, 1983, Douglas and Peggy Ryan, their 10-year-old daughter Jessica, their eight-year-old son Joshua and their 11-year-old house guest Christopher Hughes were brutally attacked in the Ryan's home in Chino Hills, California, San Bernardino County. All but Josh died from the savage blows from four weapons, a hatchet, two or three knives, and an ice pick. The medical examiner later counted a minimum of 144 wounds on the victims and during the assault, victims suffered 28 bone fractures and two extremity amputations. The crime scene looked as if the killers meant not just to kill, but to send a message of payback or retribution. The Ryan's bedroom, where all the victims were found, was covered floor to walls to ceiling in blood. Doug Ryan, a former Marine MP, had fought his way from his bedside around the bed to his wife's side and back again. But neither Doug nor Peggy Ryan had been able to grab the loaded weapons that were within arm's reach of their beds. Miraculously, when Chris Hughes' father discovered the bodies the next morning, Josh Ryan was still alive, although his throat had been slashed. A helicopter flew him to a nearby hospital where his life was saved. Meanwhile, Word of the most sensational and gruesome murders in San Bernardino County history spread like wildfire. At the crime scene over the next 48 hours, the Sheriff's Department allowed over 75 people to walk through the crime scene at the Ryan's home, contaminating and destroying the integrity of the forensic evidence. These are the weapons found that were next to the Ryan's bed. This is the list of people present at the Ryan's residence created by the Sheriff's Department. Within 48 hours, the San Bernardino District Attorney ordered the Ryan bedroom, including the carpet, floors, furniture, and ceiling, totally dismantled. Crime lab personnel trying to take blood samples were told to cease their work and help dismantle the bedroom. What was removed from the Ryan's bedroom was then deposited in a Sheriff's department storage shed with no air conditioning. As a result, the opportunity to test and analyze blood, study blood spatter, and use other forensic analysis to determine the number of attackers was lost forever. Photographs taken of the crime scene showed blood covering the furniture and walls. It looked like a ritual killing. Robbery could not have been the motive, as cash and credit cards were found in the open in the Ryan residence. The only thing missing was the Ryan station wagon, which had been parked in the driveway with his keys in it. 
The county medical examiner concluded that the assailants had to be two or more persons given the number of weapons used and the fact that so many victims, including two healthy, strong adults with loaded weapons within reach, had been subdued in so short a time. At the hospital, young Josh Ryan was self-aware enough to accurately give his name, age, and address, and he identified the assailants as three white men. Josh repeated this identification to authorities later the same day. Two more eyewitness reports surfaced. A couple living nearby the Ryan home reported that around midnight on the night of the murders, she saw what looked like the Ryan station wagon speeding down the road that leads away from the Ryan's home. That's the first sighting on our chart, sighting number one. Another couple near driving near a local bar had to stop to avoid a station wagon going fast. They saw people in the front and back of the station wagon. That's sighting number two. Sheriff's deputies also learned that shortly after midnight, the night of the murders, three white men, one of whom was wearing coveralls and a tan t-shirt, entered the same bar near where the speeding station wagon had been seen. These men acted so strangely they were refused service. Had sheriff's deputies investigated further, they would have learned that these same white men approached three women patrons in the bar. The women, who the sheriff never interviewed, saw that one of the men's coveralls and shirt were covered in blood. When one of the women pointed this out, the men left the bar. Two days after the crimes were discovered, the sheriff's department issued a criminal bulletin with a wanted description. This is their criminal bulletin with a description of the suspects. Three white or Mexican males wearing a white t-shirt and a blue short sleeved shirt. Four days after the murders were discovered, a woman named Diana Roper called the sheriff's department and reported that her boyfriend, a white man and convicted murderer named Lee Farrow, had left a pair of coveralls covered with blood on the floor of her closet early in the morning the day after the murders. When the sheriff's deputy took the bloody coveralls into custody, Roper told him she wanted to be interviewed by homicide detectives. Had the sheriff's interviewed her, she would have said that she had noticed that her boyfriend's hatchet was missing the night of the murders. She also would have said her boyfriend, Furrow, had been wearing a tan Fruit of a Loom t-shirt the night of the murders, but the sheriff's department didn't interview her, even after she gave them the bloody cover. In fact, the sheriff's department never followed up on any of these leads. Instead, two days after the murders, the sheriff's department discovered that an escaped prisoner named Kevin Cooper had been holed up in a vacant house down a hill from the Ryan's home for two days before the murders. Kevin Cooper was 25 years old black and a petty thief who was serving a sentence for residential burglary. He had walked away from a minimum security prison through a hole in the fence, traveled about three miles on foot, and then used the vacant house as a hideout before hitchhiking to Mexico. Once the sheriff's department placed <coughs> Kevin Cooper in the vacant house near the Ryan home, it locked in on him as the culprit. A black man and escaped prisoner, Cooper was a convenient suspect. Needing to solve these crimes, on June 9th, San Bernardino County Sheriff Floyd Tidwell called a press conference and publicly identified Kevin Cooper as the only suspect. From that day forward, the Sheriff's Department ignored or discarded information that pointed at other perpetrators, planted or fabricated evidence to place Kevin Cooper in the Ryan home in the Ryan station wagon and actively destroyed evidence that exculpated Cooper. They did not relent even when Josh Ryan, upon seeing a mugshot of Kevin Cooper on TV, told a deputy guarding him, that's not the one who did it. The Sheriff's Department also ignored Diana Roper's information and Lee Farrow's bloody coveralls. They never interviewed the patrons of the bar who had seen the three white men, one in coveralls with blood all over them. And even though 
they found a few days later a white fruit of the loom t-shirt in a ditch nearby with Doug Ryan's blood on it. They didn't link it to Lee Farrow, Diana Roper's boyfriend. The Sheriff's Department acted with what could be called tunnel vision. It had one objective to pin the Ryan Hughes murders on Kevin Cooper. Thus the Sheriff's Department framed Kevin Cooper instead of trying to solve the Ryan murders. The Sheriff's Department manipulated the medical examiner, they manipulated Josh Ryan, and before the trial they discarded the bloody coveralls in a dumpster without testing them in any way to determine whose blood was on them. <clears throat> Remember the Colonel Bolton? The day after the murders were discovered, a woman reported that she had found a blue shirt with blood on it near the bar where the three white men had been seen with blood on their clothes. Remember, the criminal bulletin said three white men, one in a white t-shirt, there it was. Now, we have a blue shirt with blood on it near the Canyon Corral bar. The Sheriff's Department collected that blue shirt according to their own records, but never turned it over to the defense, never alerted the defense that it existed, never tested it, and it is missing. When we found out about the blue shirt in 2004, 21 years after the murders, the Sheriff's Department took the position that the blue shirt never existed. They don't have it. They say it never existed even though their own records say that it does. This is the Sheriff's Bulletin, and highlighted in yellow is the language which shows the Sheriff's Office retrieving the blue shirt with blood on it near the Canyon Corral bar and taking it into their possession. The case goes on as you know, for many, many years thereafter. Kevin Cooper was tried in an atmosphere of racial hatred. Uh, we heard from Richard what type of a place San Bernardino County was back in the 80s. We know that the Sheriff's Department refused to go after white men and framed Kevin Cooper. We know that they created evidence such as planting cigarette butts in the Ryan station wagon when it was found. And the records that the Sheriff's Department has had to produce show that when the Ryan station wagon was first found in Long Beach, about a week after the murders, Sheriff's deputies went into it and logged everything that was in it. And there were no prison issued cigarette butts on that report. But three days later, when other San Bernardino County Sheriff's deputies came and looked at the station wagon, they found cigarette butts that they said were prison-issued uh, tobacco that must have come from Kevin Cooper. We have to remember that two days after the crimes, the Sheriff's Department went to the house that Kevin Cooper had been hiding in and took into their possession all sorts of cigarette butts from prison issued tobacco that he had smoked when he was in that hideout house. And that those cigarette butts disappeared only to show up in the Ryan station wagon a week later. How could anyone believe that the sheriff's department was so corrupt? Well, Please just consider that the sheriff himself, Floyd Tidwell, later pleaded guilty to four felony counts of stealing confiscated weapons from the sheriff's department. Tidwell had been raiding the property room for confiscated firearms 
for over 20 years, and he, he uh, stole over 400 weapons. You want some further corruption? William Baird, the chief of the sheriff's crime lab, who testified at trial about shoe prints that were supposedly linked to Kevin Cooper, was soon thereafter caught stealing heroin from the sheriff's evidence locker for personal use and sale. He was fired. But much of the corruption didn't surface until later. And that's one of the problems that the legal system has to face. When the California Supreme Court denied Kevin Cooper's direct appeal and his first habeas corpus petition in 1991, most of the evidence that I've told you about had not been undermined or discounted. And under a, a wonderful piece of legislation called the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, passed in 1996 by our own Congress, the federal courts have been stripped of the ability to look at and make their own determinations factually about cases like Kevin Cooper's. They are, they are completely unable, under the law, to make their own factual findings. They must accept the factual findings of the courts below in the state. And when those factual findings are based upon facts that have not yet been undermined, or when the evidence that the prosecution has cheated and done a Brady violation or done something like that comes out after that, the courts can't consider it. So we have a system where if you don't get the case overturned within the first several years, you are almost having to prove your innocence beyond a reasonable doubt under the statute. And that's what Kevin Cooper has faced. Now, I could go on for another two hours about talking about how the evidence in this case has been planted, destroyed, tampered with, but you don't have to take my uh, word for it. As Richard said, Judge William Fletcher of the Ninth Circuit wrote an opinion in 2009 that starts, the state of California may be about to execute an innocent man. Five additional Ninth Circuit judges joined in that opinion, so that's six judges. Five more Ninth Circuit judges said that Kevin Cooper had not gotten a fair hearing on his claims of innocence. That's 11. Judge Reinhardt, in one of the dissents, said, you know, there were more people who voted for a rehearing than the 11 people who signed their names. So we know we had 12 or 13 votes, because if we had had the 14th, <coughs> we would have had a reversal and a new hearing. And if you want any further proof that Kevin Cooper was framed and that his civil rights and his human rights were violated, on September 21st, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, which is a body of the Organization of American States, issued a decision, a final report, which said that Kevin Cooper's due process rights were violated in eight different ways. He received ineffective assistance of counsel. There was racial discrimination in the prosecution. The appellate system is unfair, and asking the governor to spare his life. I hope you'll uh, enjoy listening to Kevin. He is incredibly uh, passionate, smart, articulate, and determined. And after 11 years, uh, I think <coughs> hardly anybody that I've worked with who has more uh, veracity and honesty than Kevin. So uh, I'll be happy to answer questions a little later on. And what's the next step? We plan to file a clemency petition with Governor Brown seeking clemency because we've run out of appeals. Public Defender's Office sole DNA attorney for eight years and research attorney for the San Francisco Superior Court. 
Uh, she received a BS in genetics from UC Berkeley, MS in genetics and developmental biology from Cornell, and a JD from USF School of Law. I'm sure everybody's wondering why I'm here. And one of the things that Norm didn't get a chance to tell you about is the context of DNA in, in Kevin Cooper's case. And at the time that he was tried and convicted, DNA testing was really not available. The kind of testing they did was ABO blood typing and some other serology tests, which at best can identify a very small um, group of people but it's usually it's like 30% of the population, 20% of the population. So it's not like DNA, like you can prove someone's identity. Um, and then in 2002, I believe, DNA testing was done on the, one of the t-shirts that was identified. And unfortunately, um, the results were not good. They came back with a mixture of DNA from Kevin Cooper and I believe, is it Josh Ryan? Uh, Doug Ryan. Doug Ryan, the father. And a third person. And a third person. And very clear evidence, uh, along with other evidence of tampering, that Kevin's blood was probably planted on that t-shirt by someone in San Bernardino County before it was transferred to the Department of Justice for testing. Um, tests were done that indicate that it was a strong possibility. Um, and that's why I'm here. Apparently, there's a lot of other evidence that could be tested. Uh, that there was no opportunity to test, and that we now have tests that could potentially, for instance, with this third person that's there, identify that individual, that we could get a clean profile that could be used to identify who that person is. Um, so what I do is I work with lawyers all over now the United States, to consult with them on DNA testing and the issues relating to DNA. And one of the things that um, I wanted to talk about real briefly with you today is the differences in the power of DNA to do different things. And I love the Innocence Projects. They did an amazing job in pointing out the problems with the death penalty. But in doing so, they brought DNA to the forefront to become an infallible tool to prove innocence and to prove guilt. The problem with that paradigm is that, in fact, while DNA is very powerful to prove someone is actually innocent, it is very weak in proving that someone is guilty. And it's not only weak to prove someone is guilty, but it's also very weak to prove that someone was actually at a crime scene and committed a crime. Um, and now normally, when I, I, I talk a lot and publicly, but I usually talk to lawyers and I tend to swear an enormous amount when I'm doing that. And I'm going to try and <laughs> keep it clean here today because you're a very different audience and I don't, don't want to be offending people. I do it judiciously, actually. So it's not like f-bombs everywhere but it's, it's, it's some language anyway um, so one of the things that most of us don't really understand about DNA testing is that we are looking at incredible small amounts of material with modern tests and some of the tests that we now have could can test DNA or amounts of DNA that are equivalent to around 50 human cells and if you think about that um, there have been four people, five people standing up here today touching this lectern just in the last 45 minutes. There was probably a classroom in here or two or three today where the person lecturing was touching the same surface. And I bet you 100% that if we swab this surface we could probably identify a mixture of many, many individuals on here. And we also might be able to identify just me in one spot. Now what happens if somebody comes in tomorrow and there's a body on the floor? My DNA is here. They happen to sample the area that they think is the most obvious place for the perpetrator to have touched this object. And just because of luck, I am now a, per a suspect in that crime. 
Um, I think about this stuff all the time because I think about things like uh, rental cars. You rent a car, you drive around, you're touching the steering wheel, and uh, you return it to the rental agency. Do you think they sanitize that vehicle? No, they don't. So your DNA is now on the steering wheel. And if that car is used in a carjacking the next day, or excuse me, carjacked the next day, and you're not the person whose name was actually on the rental agreement, maybe you were with your spouse or a friend or someone, then now all of a sudden you're in that car and you could be the person who actually took it and, and was the carjacker. I think about this stuff all the time and it's really scary. And that's why I, I, this is what I mean when I say that the value of DNA evidence is really minimalistic today in the context of crime scenes. We have touch DNA, we have low copy DNA, we have what's called enhanced methods testing where we can get down into the weeds so low that in cases I have seen, samples which used to be single source samples, meaning they came from one person, are retested and now all of a sudden they are mixtures. And so what we didn't know when it was tested the first time was actually it wasn't one person, it was two or it was three. So the other thing about the test is that there are all these artifacts that come with this tiny amount of DNA. It's very complicated, I'm not gonna bore you or get into it, but there are lots of artifacts. Um, this is just a quote from one of the, the heavy hitters in uh, the world of DNA testing. He's an individual who works for the National Institute of Standards and Technology, John Butler, and he writes these big heavy books that are the sort of bibles of forensic DNA testing. And the interesting part is the, the red part where he says, and it's similar to looking for an object in the mud or trying to describe the image in a fuzzy photograph. That is the kind of DNA <laughs> testing that we are working with now. But in a case like this, there could be a very powerful tool that could be put to use on the evidence, the t-shirt in particular, to see all sorts of facts about it that maybe were ignored or might shed light <coughs> on who owned that shirt or whose blood is actually on that shirt, and to look broadly at patterns of blood on that shirt to determine how and when and why the blood got there. And this, just an ex this is what I look at all the time. This is my life. Um, this is data from a DNA test. This is a mixed sample. It's a very complicated mixture. And you can see there's all sorts of handwriting on here. This is not something that the machine spits out. This is not CSI where they feed the, the <laughs> material into a machine, come back two hours later and says, they have a picture of this person, right? <laughs> this is very subjective. And that's why people have to write things down on their little piece of paper around their data. All the little brackets and the, the um, parentheses all have meaning, which is a subjective interpretation of the data. And depending on how you look at this and how subjective you are and how much bias you have, you can include almost anything in, in uh, a sample. And actually there are cases I have seen where the statistics associated with a sample like this are that basically 50% of the human population would be included as a source of the sample. And then on the flip side of that, one in a hundred sextillion individuals might be uh, possible sources. So it goes from those types of extremes because of issues like this. So the end result of this, all this new technology we have and the way that people are interpreting it, there, there, there are good things and bad things about it. There are more inclusions <coughs> because of shoddy work and poor interpretation. That's number one. The second thing is that there are fewer exclusions. Because of all the artifacts, the analysts feel like they can invoke that and say, well, we're missing information, this isn't perfect, but we have enough that we think that this is an inclusion, and then they give it some crazy statistic. <clears throat> the other option they have is to do inconclusive, say inconclusive, and that to a defense attorney is a good thing because it means they're saying we can't say yes or no. But then what happens is the DA walks into court and he gets this little chart that I showed you and he puts it up there in front of the jury and he says, but Mr. Cooper's peak right there, it's there, right? It's, it, that's consistent with him. And goes through it to show 
that in fact, even though they're saying we don't understand our data, we can't make any conclusions, that they're asking jurors who are not trained in this to draw conclusions about the data that they themselves say have no meaning. I don't know why judges allow it, but they do. Um, and this is a great, this is a great book. If you, anybody has any interest in um, learning more about this kind of stuff, it's very accessible, it's very interesting, it's written by this guy Peter Gill, and Peter Gill is the grandfather of low copy number testing in the, United, in, in the UK, and he's a big name, and he basically came out with this book to tell all of us that we better be pretty careful with this evidence. And he talks about something called the naive investigator, which is what happened in Kevin Cooper's case, where they came to a conclusion that there was one person who was a suspect, and they focused their entire investigation on proving that fact rather than doing an investigation to prove who actually committed the crimes. And he talks about this fact that you can take information that is the, something that you think is the closest match. He's talking about DNA, but this applies everywhere. Um, and you ignore exculpatory information and you focus solely on what you think um, the, other, the evidence that you have is showing you. And you ignore everything else. And trust me, this happens all the time. Anyway, it's a great book and it's much more complicated, but it's, it's a really good book to look at if you have any interest in this stuff. And then this is another book which I would, if you like a, a really good read, it's written by a, a friend of mine who's a professor at NYU Law School. Mm -hmm. And it is, um, I, I mentioned in it, so. You know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really interesting book. She talks a lot about um, contamination and false, um, false inclusions. She talks about what happens in crime labs. You think what happened in Kevin Cooper's case is bad. There are labs around the country where this is happening all the time. And nobody is doing anything about it. Um, we really need to do something about it because people, I personally believe people are being convicted based on DNA evidence that are actually innocent because of all the issues that are contained in these two books. And I think I'm out of time, so uh, I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Becca. Um, I, we're expecting Kevin to call um, about now, but it looks like he hasn't called yet. Um, yeah, maybe we could maybe we could take a few questions at this point, and then if Kevin calls, we'll just uh, you know just cut it short. So um, you know, we'll take questions from the floor. Um, please try to limit your comments to two minutes or less. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, I was just wondering about Josh Ryan and where he is today and who's involved in any way. Um, and then uh, Josh Ryan is now uh, still in the Southern California area. Um, after the way from our perspective, he was manipulated as a child. He has come to the conclusion that uh, Kevin is guilty. Um, when we filed our habeas corpus petition in 2004, after Kevin's execution was stayed, we asked the federal judge for the chance to uh, interview him and to uh, uh, look into how he had come to the conclusions that they had. And, and she, as she did with everything we asked for, denied us the right to, uh, to talk to him but she let him give a, a victim impact statement at the end of the hearing without us having a chance to uh, uh, cross-examine him. Well, here's Kevin. Kevin? Hello? Kevin, how are you? Yes. Yes. Oh, great. No. I'm not surprised. Uh, okay. 
I'm going to uh, plug in the, this phone to the PA system, and um, we'll uh, you can make a statement uh, as you wish, and then we'll get started. Uh, everybody should understand that there will be interruptions by a recording saying this is coming from a correctional facility, so just have to live with that. Kevin? Hello? Okay. Yeah. Great. We can hear you fine. You can hear me? We can hear you fine. All right. Hey, um, hey, good evening. I um, have a short statement I'd like to make, and I'd like to do so from a historical perspective, because as William Faulkner wrote, history as it was, history is. And what's going on today in America concerning the death penalty and mass incarceration and fair walking? life in prison without the possibility of parole. It's historic. It's nothing new. Over 50 years ago, Malcolm X stated in his message to the grassroots, the youth at this time who we were speaking to, he said, don't be shocked when I say I was in prison. You are still in prison. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. That's what America means. Here we are in the 21st century, and many poor people and people of color, America still means prison. This is a historical truth. This country leaves the world in prison, and in prison means poor people, and especially its poor minority people. This country called America. This historic truth is one of the reasons that we're having this event tonight. And we're still fighting for our collective human rights. A long time ago, in this country, the United States Supreme Court Justice very good Marshall, I'm thinking while I'm talking, it's been a long day. He stated the people who are fighting for their collective civil rights at that time and were told under the law that what they were doing was wrong, that they couldn't fight for their rights because it was against the law to do so. He said, do what's right, and wait for the law to catch up. <laughs> do what's right, and wait for the law to catch up. So here we are, this evening, doing what's right. Waiting for the law to catch up. On such important issues as mass incarceration, the death penalty, and life in prison without the possibility of parole. There's something wrong in this system, in this country, in this world, where people can still be executed if they're innocent or especially because they're black. And that's where I'm at right now in my life, on death row, an innocent man who this state wants to execute, despite all the evidence that we have, proof of my innocence. Not just my innocence, but the fact that I was framed by the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department. This is unbelievable that here in the 21st century, these type of things can still happen. I, like many people, didn't know what happened to me because it happened to me without my knowledge, without my permission, or without me being conscious to the fact that it was happening. But I was in prison by things like racism and classism and sexism, homophobia, religious prejudice, and all the other things long before I was incarcerated in San Quentin. Because it's these things that help get me to San Quentin because they're right within America's criminal justice system. This institutional racism, this white supremacy, is just as real today as it was yesteryear. Like back in 1857, when then United States Supreme Court Justice 
Roger B. Cheney pulled slave and black man um, Red Scott. But he had no rights and the white man was down in respect. I feel like a 21st century trans Scott. Because I have no right to these people are trying to respect. And I'm sure I'm not the only one to feel this way in their system. Thurgood Marshall knew something then that we know now. That for the most part in American history, the law has been on the wrong side of history. And it's on the wrong side of history now. It's up to us to make this system, this law, become right. And the only way I believe that we can do it is by having a website like this all over this country, by organizing, agitating, and demanding change. Because this is modern day, but yet it is historic. My people, African Americans, have been in prison in this country since we got here in 1619. First, we were in prison on slave ships. Then we were imprisoned on plantations, chattel slavery. And then we were from that to slavery by another name, the prison leasing stuff that they put together after slavery. And here today, we're still in prison. We're the most imprisoned people in this country. Why? What did we do? What is it is about this blackness, this skin, that makes us targets for the system. And everybody knows it's racist. But yet it's still happening. Every report that any group of people that are for real and serious and all is put together says that this system is racist. Yet this stuff still happens. And it's been happening. Malcolm X said America means prison. And that was way back in the early 1960s. And here we are in 2015 in the 21st century, and Americans still need to prison. You know, I don't, let me, let me, you know, I have something else I want to say, but I'm going to say this instead. To show you how familiar these people are about killing us. This evening, about 6 o'clock, I didn't even think I was going to get the phone tonight, because we're on lockdown all day. But this evening, they passed out these new lethal injection protocols. This one drug uh, thing that they want to do. The state of California now has their own um, compounding drug pharmacy. So they're going to make their own drugs. So they can kill us. And they send psychiatrists around here to us 18 inmates who don't have any appeals left. And in so doing, they ask us, is we all right? Do we want to talk about this? Is there anything we have to say? Mm -hmm. I personally told the person I had nothing to say and don't come back because I didn't want to talk to me anymore. But this is part of the psychological warfare that you're starting already. Mm -hmm. This is a deep ass system. So they're starting to kill some of us already just by doing this stuff and they know it. <laughs> Here in America, the land of the free and the home of the brave. I am. Um, I know that many of you are law students. And I hope for your sake and the sake of your generation and future generations that you know the truth about this criminal justice system. Mm. Because if you do, you will find out that it's not all that it should be, that all that it can be, or all that it will be. It's not the best in the world that people claim it is. It will never be as long as political ideology reigns supreme. Did not, um, the United States Constitution, what American law is built on and based on, is only as good as any five members of the United States Supreme Court says it is at any one time, or any point in time in the history or in any case. So that's not the law per se, that's political ideology. Mm -hmm. And this is what happened to me in federal district court, so much so that Norman, my attorney, why I'm truly blessed to have is he was fighting for my life, like he's fighting for his own. He told federal district judge Marilyn Huff 
that you are allowing the state to violate my client's constitutional rights. He can work it. Because all these Brady violations that I had in this case, I should have got reversed a long time ago. You know, those of you who don't know what Brady violations are, it's um, the state was holding up material exculpatory evidence. And I got about five of those. We didn't just withheld evidence on purpose all the time. But because of her political ideology, which is right wing Republican conservative, she let him get away with it. And just pay him no money. But if she don't do it, I get a new trial and I get out of here. And that was 10 years ago. So I say these different things to you because all of this is connected to me as a black man. My history, my present, and my possible future. But yet I fight on. I could give up. But I can't. I won't. I fight on. I hope that you will fight. Not just for me, but for you. For yourself. Because what happened to me can happen to you. Especially if you're poor in America. This is about the haves and the have nots. And the haves have not made it to death row. There is nobody on death row but poor people. So the question is, what you want to do about it? I don't know how many of you were there, but I thank you for coming. As I told Richard Tan, and I thank him for him putting this event together, that I wouldn't care if it was only one person who came, because that one person can make a difference, a different real. And we have to be so at this point in time, in the history of this world, in the history of this state. So I hope this gives you something to think about concerning black man on death row, who did nothing more than put himself in a position for police to get their hands on him, and they did the rest. I was asked a long time ago, why was I framed by the police? And at that time, because I was so uneducated and miseducated, I couldn't ask that question. But then it dawned on me one day. They framed me because I was trainable. Just like they shoot unarmed black men in the street because they're shootable. And what does that mean? That means that they, as the authorities, can do what they want to do and get away with it. And nobody's going to stop them. Nobody's going to stand in their way. Nobody's going to believe us. They're going to believe them. This is our reality in America today. It's always been like that. So I get to ask you what you're going to do. You want to put up or you want to shut up? I'm putting up. I'm fighting for my life. I'll get no tomorrow. I said, hey, but they kill me. So, I thank you. I'm a solidarity with you. The struggle goes on. It goes on with or without you. I hope it's with you. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. You have 60 seconds remaining. I have called back. I would like to ask a question. Call back in a second. Um, that's Kevin. Uh, he is about as courageous and determined and smart and uh, full of life as anybody I've met. And uh, I hope that uh, we can keep him that way. Um, while, while we're waiting for the callback, I just thought I'd mention one thing that along with what Vicka was talking about. Uh, as Vicka said, in, in 2002, there was DNA testing done on a t-shirt on, on, on another object. Uh, and we uh, say that, that Kevin's DNA was planted on the t-shirt by using his blood, which was preserved with a chemical called EDTA when he was arrested and was put into a vial. And so we, we said, we'll prove that it was, it was planted by 
<clears throat> doing testing to show that there's heightened levels of this chemical EDTA on the spot that you're taking the <coughs> DNA from. Logical conclusion. I'll finish it later. In California, this call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. To accept this call, send or dial 5 now. Thank you for using Global Tell Link. Hi, Kevin. You're back with us. All right, how was that? Yeah, how, how, was, how was that? Everything good? Everything is good, and you're still on the... <laughs> Hey, if anybody has any questions for me, I will answer your question. If not, then I wish you peace and show more solidarity. I'm out of here. Any questions? Yes. Um, you, you need to come down to the phone because he can't. Or we'll repeat it, whichever you like. You can just repeat it. Um, I met Kevin about, oh, probably the last time I saw him about 15 years ago. But I know other people in that situation, and I know what's happening to the health of those men who've been there a long time, and I wondered how Kevin's health is. Kevin, uh, the question is, uh, how is your health? I'm in great health. <laughs> wow. uh, I, let me just add to that. Uh, Kevin is uh, in very uh, good health except for his knee. You want to talk about that, Kevin? Oh, yeah, okay. I um, On March 29th, a few months ago, I was out on the yard playing basketball in a basketball tournament. Me, I'm an old man, but I don't like to think I am. I was chasing the ball, and I didn't see a stool that was attached to the table. So I hit the stool with my knee, and I tore the tendons away from my knee. So I had to have surgery. And on July 23rd, I had surgery to reattach the tendons to my knee. And so I have been rehabilitating myself over the last four months. And um, I'm not using a brace anymore, or well, not the big steel brace that I had after surgery. And um, I'm walking good. I'm doing everything that I used to do except play ball and except run because that comes in time and it's only been four months. But other than that, my health is great because I exercise daily and I stay positive and I, you know, don't do drugs and I don't, none of that stuff. I'm just taking care of myself. Another question. Um, just because we're all looking at you, Kevin, uh, we have a number of uh, of your paintings here, uh, and the question is, how does that help you? And, and can you tell us a little bit about how you go about doing it and choosing your subjects, etc.? Oh, um, well, how can I say? Painting to me is my escape. You know, everybody practices escapism in their lives. Some people do it through drugs, alcohol. Uh, people do it different ways. Mine. It's too hard. It relieves my stress. And, you know, I just paint whatever I feel like painting. You know, sometimes I paint two or three paintings at a time. Just to, I, get, I don't want to overwork one, so I start another one. I don't want to get thrown out on one, so I start another one. But, no, there's no um, method to my madness. It's just a matter of doing it. Kevin, let, let me add to that that uh, Kevin has a number of paintings that aren't here tonight, obviously, that are on a traveling exhibition called Windows on Death Row. Uh, the exhibition opened for the first time about two weeks ago at USC uh, in Southern California, and it will travel across the country and across the world and end up in Geneva, Switzerland, uh, next spring. Uh, so anybody want to make reservations to go and see it there, then please do. Question. Yes. So there's a delegation of former prisoners and abolitionists going to Palestine this spring, next spring. What message do you have for them, Kevin, for the former prisoners and people in Palestine? Kevin, could you hear the question? No. There is a. No, I didn't hear it. There is a. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. 
There's a group of uh, former prisoners who are traveling to Palestine next year. Um, have you heard about that? No, I have not. Not yet. What, I have not. what message do you have? What message do you have for those people who are on that trip? Or in Palestine as well? You show solidarity, real solidarity with our Palestinian brothers and sisters. Because the, the same thing that's happened to us over here and what's happening to the what has happened to the um, indigenous peoples of this land is happening to them over there. And they, they need to know that they are cared about, that they are respected, they are loved, and they are supported by someone over here. When this government doesn't show them, so does the people to show them. Any other questions? <laughs> uh, Kevin, uh, that's the end of the questions from here, but I just want to alert you that Tom Parker is here with us tonight. Uh, hey, Mr. Parker, how you doing? Oh, Tom, my bad. How you doing, Tom? <laughs> I'm doing great. Thanks for calling me Tom. <laughs> and also, Elspeth Farmer is here, Kevin. Uh, oh, what's up, Elspeth? How you doing, my friend? She says, good, we'll see you next Thursday, Kevin. Okay, that's good. That's good, that's great. You know, and if Rebecca's there, <laughs> yes. to my love and my solidarity to you, Rebecca, thank you for um, taking Carol's place because I understand what happened to them all. So I appreciate you being there. It's my pleasure, Kevin, and I love you. And Pat Foley is oh, here as well. All right, Pat, how are you doing, my friend? I'm doing all right, my friend. I love you, too. Questions? Yeah, All right. I, heard say, I heard you say his um, appeal hey, was hey, on I would like to say one thing before I leave, Norman. Okay, I've got one question. Can you hold just a second, Kevin? How much? I, heard, yeah. I, heard, I heard you mention that the appeals are exhausted. And anybody that's been through the Cajun process knows what that's about. Um, have, has there been any efforts to create a public appeal? Um, there's a film called The Murder of Fred Hampton. This is, at, you know, I don't know if that's the worst, an attempted murder of Kevin Cooper. I mean, it's anybody reached out to somebody to, to begin a, 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 a public campaign? Uh, the question is whether there's a public campaign uh, to try to get the word out about your case to the world, Kevin. And, uh, why don't you answer that, and then also Rebecca is going to talk about that in a minute or two. But go ahead, Kevin. Cool. I um, greatly appreciate any and all help from everybody who is willing to get the truth out. See, I'm not so much concerned about getting the word out. I'm trying to get the truth out. And the system has been oppressing not just me, but my truth, our truth. We need people to stand up and speak out and say, hey, something's wrong with this case. I have never, and you know, I read a lot of history in here. I read a lot of death penalty cases. And my case is the first case in the history of the state of California where you have 12 federal circuit judges saying something's wrong with this case. Eleven of them dissented. Six said one thing, but five said the state may be about to execute innocent man. This is unprecedented. This has never happened. Same thing with the Inter-American Commission for Human Rights Report. That has never happened to a death row inmate before. In this state, to my knowledge, especially while he's alive. So all these people who are saying these things, they can't be wrong. They can't be right. I'm looking at Mr. Parker. Paul, up ahead, who is an ex-FBI special agent, <coughs> took this case pro bono after he read it. And he's putting his heart and soul into this. Same with Norman. Norman could be retired. He could get it back on the boot somewhere. <laughs> but he's not. He's fighting for my life. These people 
people with integrity. Same with Elspeth. Same with Rebecca. They don't stand strong with me in this. They have not backed down. They have not backed away. They stood up. I said, this is a law. These people have integrity. They have respect. They're not lying. There's something fundamentally wrong with this case. I was fighting. So, if we can get the word out about this, get the truth out about this, I'll be forever thankful. What I want to say, and it goes along with this, is that this state, I don't know if they're going to succeed or not because they've written protocols before that were denied down the line. But this state is serious about restarting this. Killing machine. So they can kill us. They got these words that I read. Child said they're trying to avoid pain and all this stuff. But the bottom line is they're trying to kill us. They have no right to do this. But they want to do it. <laughs> and if we don't fight them back, they will do it. Innocence doesn't make any difference to these people. They have a long history of killing innocent people. This is real. The indigenous people who ran this place, they were innocent. They got slaughtered. The slaves that they brought over here from Africa were innocent. They were tortured and slaughtered. And didn't help do a discussion. You can say the same thing about the Chinese who did the trans American Railroad. Just, what I'm saying is, innocence makes no difference to these cold-blooded killers. They kill because they can. And if we don't fight back, they're not just... This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. They're not just going to kill. We didn't want to kill everybody they can while they can. Because we know, truth be told, this thing is on this last leg. And they're going to fight that much harder to do it. To kill. Talking about, they want to bring closure to people. Talking about finality. They used to say it was God's will. What they going to say next? They used to say there was a painless execution with people in Jackson. And when, they, when that was a lie, they, now they say there's no such thing as a painless execution. You law students who are here, understand this, what the United States Supreme Court is doing. In order to uphold a constitutional law, which they say the death penalty is, <laughs> they're violating the constitutional law, the Eighth Amendment, on cruel and unusual punishment, to enforce a constitutional law, the death penalty. They're letting people experiment on drugs and experiment on the people that they kill. That's hypocrisy. They're doing the same thing with the anti terrorism and the death penalty act. In 1963, the United States Supreme Court passed the Brady v. Maryland, saying the states cannot withhold material exculpatory evidence. 1996, Congress passed and Bill Clinton signed into law with the anti terrorism Act. So they're using this new law in 1996 to supersede the law in 1963. Right. So they're using one constitutional law to override another constitutional law. This is hypocrisy. But this is America. So, yeah, we need to expose all this. Because if they did this, they need in their ass and we proved it. How many other people up here because they're the same thing done to them? Not just men, but women. There are women on death row. They don't have no voice. Nobody's speaking for them. Somebody should. So I am. What are they going to do? Kill me for doing it? I need as much. So, my attorneys need as much help, my supporters, my friends need as much help as we can get to expose the truth about what this state has done to me, is doing to me, and wants to do to me. You have 60 seconds remaining. That's it. That's all I got to say about that. Can I say something, Kevin? Sure. Railroading which is what happened to him, is first-degree, cold-blooded, premeditated murder of the justice system. And I would like the people who have done this to Kevin and the millions of other people to trade places. 
-hmm. For sure. sure. We have 30 seconds remaining. Uh, I have to call back to see where we come up. Okay, Kevin? Yeah. Still there? Yeah. Okay. Yes. I'm going to call back. Call back. All right. There is a there's an epidemic, as uh, former Chief Judge uh, Alex Kaczynski of the Ninth Circuit has said, an epidemic of prosecutorial misconduct uh, abroad in the land, and that uh, gets worse and worse. And um, unfortunately, the justice system defends it, while the judges are upset about it. Uh, our Attorney General uh, uh, appeals cases where prosecutorial misconduct has been found and tries to overturn it. So. Clinton, San Clinton, California. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. To accept this call, say or dial 5 now. Thank you for using Global Telling. Kevin? Yes. Okay, we can hear you. What was, what was your question? Uh, we had a statement about uh, the prevalence of people who are using the justice system to do crimes themselves, and they should be punished for doing it. Uh, exactly. Very bad. Any other questions for? Can Kevin hear me? Because I, I wanted him to hear that. I don't know. Uh, I don't. Kevin, can you hear the questions at all? Nope. Oh. Maybe. We're fighting. Yes. We're, uh, one of the one of the people here said that uh, a lot of people are being railroaded, as you have been railroaded, and uh, the justice system continues to railroad people. Uh, in convicting them of crimes, no matter whether they're innocent or not, and that's certainly what we've been seeing. Um, the latest count we have is 155 people since the death penalty was reinstituted who have been exonerated off death row. Uh, and the count that I have at the moment that I think is accurate is nine people have been. Uh, exonerated after they were executed. Uh, now, we know there are a lot more than that who are who were innocent, but they were executed. But those are the ones that have, have we, we now know for sure. My question is, um, yeah. my question is um, about the, uh, <clears throat> the person who survived Josh Ryan and um, how does the, you know, how did the district attorney um, justify the difference in, you know, his first, what he said, who the, who the people were, the perpetrators that were, that were in his house, three, three white men, uh, um, and, and, and the difference of, you know, what happened, did he testify, and what has happened to him? Uh, 
Kevin, the question, and, and go ahead and do uh, your uh, answer to this one. I'll chime in if I think I need to. It, it is how do they justify the change in Josh Ryan's testimony, and where is he uh, on this issue today? I, um, I don't know where he's at on the issue today, but using common sense, he's still around with the state. And that is the problem. That's what happened to his testimony. The state flipped it. He was a child. I'm going to put it to you in terms like this. He was a child. He saw my picture on TV. He said, no, that's not him. He's not the one who did it. Okay, so they flipped him from that. He didn't, they didn't flip him to say it was me. They flipped him to say he saw one person or one shadow or one puff of hair or something like that. Now, if he had saw my picture on TV and said, yeah, that is him, they would have used that testimony to put them needles in my arms on February 9th, 2004, February 10th, 2004. But because he didn't say it was me, because he told the truth and said it was not me, they sent him because he was a child. He was easily influenced. I did. We now have a memory in <laughs> To explain to all this, how it was done. So that's not hard to understand. Because you have to understand something about the police. If they learn how to find evidence, they learn how to plant evidence. If they learn how to interrogate the witness, if they learn how to call the witness or flip a witness. Because they're master manipulators. That's part of their job. To do these things. And that thing, you know, that's the best way I can answer your question. I'll add to that just a second, Kevin, and that you said it much more articulately than I could have, but one of the things that shows how Josh Ryan was manipulated is that his statement that was used at trial, which was done many months after the crimes, was that he saw a puff of hair. Now, the significance of that was that the mugshot of Kevin that uh, they had been using all along had Kevin's hair was in an afro. But when the Ryans were murdered, Kevin's hair was in braids. Very close break. This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. So they didn't care about the fact that they had gotten Josh Lyon to actually lie about seeing a puff of hair. And the evidence was that there wouldn't have been a puff to see at the time. But that was the way they manipulated it. Uh, and that was typical of, how, of other evidence that they manipulated in such a way as to uh, uh, get, the, get the conviction. So we focus this Another question coming, Kevin, just hold on. So we focus this evening um, a great deal on, on evidentiary issues, the evidence against Kevin that was um, collected by the San Bernardino um, Sheriff's Department. But it took a, it took a prosecuting force, it took, a, you know, it took prosecutors to actually prosecute him. And I'm wondering what the track record for prosecutorial misconduct was with the San Bernardino County Prosecutor's Office. And if there's any, I understand that we're, we're out of appeals, but is there any way, shape, or form to discredit that? Because we've, we've, you know, the city, the state of California has been very enlightened the past five years or so over the prosecutorial misconduct of various departments throughout the state. Um, and in Texas, as you know, Anthony Graves was uh, wrongfully convicted and freed, and the attorney who prosecuted him uh, was disbarred by the state of Texas. So I'm wondering, is there, do we have a plan of attack from that end? Uh, the question, Kevin, is, uh, is, is do we know of any statistics about prosecutorial misconduct within the San Bernardino County District Attorney's Office? And more generally, uh, do we have a plan of attack with respect to uh, exposing prosecutorial misconduct? Well, I don't know the history of 
Senator Leader Comic Sheriff Department or District Attorney's Office or anything like that, and I'm Tom Parker does. And he will be better to answer that question once I hang up the phone. And the same can be said about our plans to do anything. I don't want to say anything over the phone that these people who are agents of the state can take back and give to the people that we're fighting. So um, I understand your question and why it's important, but I would leave that to Norman and Tom to handle after I hang up. Fair enough. Oh, other than say this, it is a public record, the Brady violations and the evidence that they kept away from us and the things that they have done. It's on my fact sheets, it's on my website. So those um, things have already been exposed. Um, One more question, Kevin. What's the... What's the political climate right now of challenging the Anti-Terrorist and Effective Death Penalty Act? And, and, and how can we support uh, him in his uh, clemency? All right, the second part of the question, how to support Kevin in clemency, uh, we're going to let Rebecca talk about in a minute. Um, Kevin, uh, have you heard, I certainly haven't, of any efforts to repeal the AEDPA? No, no, and you would think that since Bill Clinton is out there apologizing for the things uh, that he did to help uh, in prison more black people, <laughs> that he would say something about repealing that thing, you know. But no, I haven't, I haven't uh, uh, heard anything. But I do know this: many judges have written and spoke out about against that act. Because that's taking away people's habeas corpus. Yeah. You know, and habeas corpus is what this country is founded on. It's part of the Magna Carta. You know, this is real stuff that they, they produce. Like I said, these, these, these people with their political ideologies are the ones that's doing this. So this is not the law. I mean, it is the law, but it's also the, being upheld by people with a certain political ideology. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, let, me, let me just add one thing about the, the, the uh, uh, AEDPA and the death of habeas corpus. Uh, what really uh, drives it home to me how much we have lost here is that uh, in the middle 90s when I was at Ninth Circuit Conference and the Supreme Court Chief Justice from Russia spoke and somebody asked him in the Q&A said what what's the thing that you most need in Russia in order to have your system be as good as ours <laughs> and he said you have the great writ of habeas corpus until we have the great writ of habeas corpus we're not going to be free well we don't any longer have the great writ of habeas corpus because of the AEDPA there you go. Uh, now, we want to make sure that uh, Rebecca talks a little bit about how to help. Um, so, okay. are there more questions? Okay. I'm going to close, and I'm going to just say this. I thank all of you for attending, and I thank all of you for putting this in together, and we're in this together. I'm always out of line. I'm fighting this thing, and I'm not just fighting for me. I'm fighting for many of my ancestors whose names I don't even This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. This fight is right there, sister. And it cost them many lives. It cost them their lives and many lives. But I'm fighting because this stuff is wrong. Mm -hmm. It is so wrong. Still more solidarity. I'm Kevin Cooper. Peace to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
hard you have to follow. Try to follow. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Yeah. 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 So my name is Rebecca Doran. Um, I am a member of the Kevin Cooper Defense Committee, and I've been a prison activist and an anti-death penalty activist for years. And in 2003, I heard about this guy named Kevin Cooper, who was most likely innocent, most likely framed up, and was out of appeals. So through a friend of mine, I made an introduction to Kevin, and I applied for a, a, a petition to go into the prison and have contact visits with Kevin. And on the day that my application was approved, that was the very day that Kevin was issued his death warrant. So that's how he and I became friends. It was really intense. So on the day that I actually met him face to face and went to San Quentin, I believe he had something like 37 days left to live. And that's how we started our relationship. So a lot of people have asked, well, have, are you guys doing anything? Is there any activism around Kevin? I'm going to say yes, my god, yes. And the days leading up, in the weeks leading up to his execution, we were in the streets every single day. I shouldn't say his execution, it's the execution. He rejects that term. His. We were in the streets. We had committees building websites, doing leaflets. We were out there passing out leaflets. We were taking phone numbers, and we were gathering an army of supporters to stop the execution. And we were doing it in tandem with probably the best law team I've ever worked with, ever. I mean, Norm, you guys are amazing. And the week before the scheduled execution, we were actually seriously in the street. I believe it was every single day, wasn't it, Pat? It was every day, and it was February, and it was cold, and we didn't give a damn. We were out there, and we had a lot of people, a lot of people out there. The execution was set for midnight, which is such a bizarre, sick thing on February 10th. They love to do it at midnight. And on February 9th, we woke up not knowing what was going to happen. We thought our friend was going to die in a really horrible, violent way. We, we planned to march to San Quentin to protest the execution, and it looked like we were also going to have a, vis a vigil. And I hate having vigils out of that. It's so sick. And so right before we were about to leave for the march, word came down that the Ninth Circuit issued a stay of execution. Please keep me on legal stuff, that th there was um, a stay of execution and Kevin wouldn't be executed on the 10th and we were just so excited. So I called the prison and I said, I would like to make an appointment to visit Kevin Cooper tomorrow. And the guard laughed at me and said, no, Kevin's going to be dead tomorrow. And so I fought with him for a long time and when I hung up the phone I still didn't have an appointment to see Kevin the next day. And sure enough, right after that, word came down that our wonderful ex-state uh, attorney general, Bill Lockyer, was filing to the Supreme Court to have the stay lifted. And that is where we were when we started the march. It was the most violent, emotional roller coaster I think that we've all ever been through. And so that afternoon, hundreds of us marched to San Quentin, and it was cold, and it was dark, and we were banging on drums, and we were just screaming and chanting and keeping each other safe and warm. And as we got close to San Quentin, we made a right turn, hundreds of us, and we had to go under a, an overpass. We had to go through a tunnel. And as we emerged from that tunnel, we were met with about 300 other activists who met us. There was so much light all of a sudden, and we were met with bullhorns. And people told us that Kevin would not be executed that night, that the Supreme Court had decided to keep this day of execution, <laughs> and we, that vigil turned into quite possibly the most wonderful celebration I've ever had in my entire life. There were hundreds of us standing in front of San Quentin, hugging each other and bawling. And I think that's the first time I ever told that story without crying, so forgive me for <coughs> start crying. And that happened because of activism. It happened because of wonderful lawyers in tandem with people in the streets. Our goal was to place pressure on the courts to do the right thing. It was to stop that execution. We're still fighting for that, but we're also fighting, as those teachers say, to free Kevin Cooper. Not to save Kevin Cooper, but free him. And in the years since the, that horrible time, Kevin has inserted himself, as you heard, in probably every struggle that I can think of. Solidarity with the Palestinians. He's such a feminist. He's an anti-war activist. He supported Lynn Stewart, Mumi Abu-Jamal, and just about everyone else I have. That means he's ours. He's one of ours. He's part of our community. And it's our job 
It is our job, not just to stop the execution, but to get him. We need to march to San Quentin again together, and we need to bring him out. That's our job. And so I am a member of the Kevin Cooper Defense Committee, and that's not just my committee. I'm hoping that all of you <laughs> will see that as yours as well. I'm urging everyone to go to the website, first of all. We have a wonderful website. It's called freekevincooper.org. There is a petition. Do we have paper petitions here as well? No? Okay. This is where I really, really need you guys right now. I need you to go to the website, sign the petition for Jerry Brown to grant clemency. Put that on your Facebook page. Ask your mom to sign it. Ask your sisters. Ask your friends, your kids. Ask everyone you know to sign it. It's not a radical question, <laughs> you know, just, uh, you know, it's this, uh, this is, there's nothing radical about that. It's a very simple thing to do. You can go to Facebook and follow Kevin Cooper. We also have a Twitter site for Kevin. But those are just the first steps. We need all of you. We need to know you. We need your contact information. We need to get to know everybody here because soon we're going to be in the streets again for Kevin. And we need each and every one of you to come out. So I would like to free Kevin Cooper as soon as possible, but I would also like to use this case of just absolute corruption to shut down the death house. Shut it down. Mm. Completely shut it down. Mm. So let's work together. Mm. If you have any questions for me, please you know, come up and ask any questions. We have other Kevin Cooper activists. Pat is a very dear friend of Kevin's. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you. amazing book called Scapegoat, The Framing of Kevin Cooper. This is an amazing book that covers all the details that Norm didn't have time to go over today. It's 30 years of a frame up. So this is an amazing book. So, so would Ryan probably if, I, if I could just if, if I could just interject. Um, so we have a little bit of time left now, so we'll, we'll do questions, um, if there are any questions. We'll take two or three questions at a time. Please try to limit what you say to two minutes. Um, so I think the first question is over there. Uh, I mean, it sounds like there's such a cover-up. I mean, does it even matter who, um, I mean, is it still, does it matter who murdered the Ryans? And, and is, 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 were they murdered for organized crime? Or is there any, I don't want to say, but it, it sounds like organized crime and they... But we're trying to identify the three white men, obviously. Right. <laughs> and we think that we have a lot of leads to them. Uh, and we think that if we got touch DNA testing, uh, that there's some chance that we would find the DNA of whoever did it, and it might be the unidentified uh, people who showed up in the prior DNA testing. Do you know who that girlfriend is? That yeah. Oh yeah. She's she's not no longer with us. She's uh, deceased, but we know her boyfriend, and he's still at loose. Yeah. Uh, next is the uh, lady. There's not a 
limit it. There's not public defenders that can take on these cases. People are being forced in situations where they have to take a plea because, you know, given the maximum, the sentencing maximum for the crime, you're really scared to go to take it to, to trial. So I just want us to remember that. And once we free Kevin Cooper, this energy and this resource, let's take it back to this place where we don't have to have a Kevin Cooper. Is the book got all the latest up to date stuff in it? Yes, the book is about um, four years old, five years old, so five years old. So all the evidence is in there. Yes, uh, although I, let me just say we have found a lot more evidence since the book was written that exonerates Kevin. Mm -hmm. Wow. wow. Yeah. I'm the man with the purple shirt. <laughs> My name is Teo Chung, and I went to law school because I have a dream of working with the Innocence Project. So while I wait for the bar results, no. I'm writing suppression motions for a public defender's office. Um, and so this is a parent system. So if there's anything on the Legal Defense Committee, if there's any room for a post bar, <laughs> I would love to help. Yeah, I had a question for Norm, and Norm, you'll have to forgive me because I got a C minus in con law. But um, I was um, when we when you say that we're, we've exhausted our appeals, does that mean that we cannot appeal with the state supreme court? And my understanding, of, I know that my understanding of um, my understanding of the premise of your case is that his constitutional rights were violated, and I'm just trying to like wrap my head around the intersection of, you know, whether, why are we confined to the state court? No, well, we're not, we're, not, we're in the Ninth Circuit, so we're in the federal court, but we, but were we denied certiori? Okay, yes. sorry. The e easy answer to that is Justice Scalia, no, I, <laughs> uh, we, we have filed, we have filed habeas petitions, Kevin's had four federal habeas petitions and five state habeas petitions. We pursued every appeal possible, and right now we cannot file another one unless we have evidence uh, that we should not have discovered before, and which would clearly show that he was innocent. And while we think we have that, the courts say no. <coughs> so believe me, we have exhausted every legal appeal, and we've, we've fought for DNA and other testing in every court we could possibly search. And we went to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights um, and got a great decision from them, but unfortunately they do not trump the Supreme Court of the United States. Yeah. Elspeth. Yeah, can you explain to the group about how, uh, whenever people hear that he has four federal habeas, I've had friends say to me, wow, that's a lot of judges who have you know, reviewed it and found him guilty. But a, the way it works in federal court is that the same judge who got the habeas the first time Get sent back to that judge again, and Norm can sort of get that. Yeah, that's a, it's a, it's a good point. The same federal judge who, who uh, denied his first, second, and third habeas petitions denied his fourth one. Oh, no. And that's why we are where we are. Um, if we'd gotten, you know, I've seen so many of these cases over the years, tracking them and working on them, and it comes down to finding, unfortunately, a really honest, judge yeah. who is willing to really look at this stuff and realize what's happening. And we, mm -hmm. Kevin has never gotten that. Mm -hmm. okay. um, next up is the woman with the gray Um My question was also about the blood sample. Um, so you said that, that the, uh, the preservative was, there was preservative? Yep. Or, and so the other question is, because I know that the, with materials that you can carbon date them or whatever. So can you do that with blood to say, oh, this blood, so if it's been in a tube, it's preserved, but once it hits the, the air and it's on the shirt, um, can you say, oh, this blood has been here 10 years or five years or so many no. The answer is no. Oh, no. no. Yeah. <laughs> but let me, just, let me just follow on that just for a second, just to show you with the corruption that's involved here. 
when we did the testing in 2004 to determine whether there was a heightened level of EDTA on the, the blood that they said was, uh, was Kevin. There were two uh, experts who did it, one that we hired and one that the state hired. The state's expert and our expert put their results in blind, so they didn't know what the results showed. Well, they both showed that there was heightened EDTA. So the state's expert, three weeks after he'd set it in, and when he suddenly knew that his testing showed that there was heightened EDTA, withdrew them. He what? He withdrew them. And the judge, same judge who denied Kevin's four mm -hmm. habeas petition, said, that's okay. Mm -hmm. oh. And we said, well, we'd like to see the records that show why he re withdrew them and what was wrong. He said there was EDTA contamination in his lab. And she said, that's denied. You can't get look into that. So that, that's the way it goes in this case. Mm -hmm. Next up is Charles. Yeah, uh, I just want excuse me. It's not a question, but I, I was thinking about you know, two salient things that you might want to consider. Uh, a friend of mine just showed me a film that they copied on DVR that was on CNN, and it was about Kevin Cooper. It was a very good documentary done by, I think, Robert Redford, the man that did an uh, incident in Ogwala, another very good film. That is a tool. It can be used, you know, small, you don't have to have a lot of people, three or four, your neighbors, your family, you know, and it's available. That's something we can do that doesn't, that doesn't cost you a dime, right. you know? Great. Second thing, so that, I forget the name, what is the name of that film, by the way? It, it's Death Row Stories is the name of the program, and the episode is Murder on the Mountaintop. There you go, there you go. And lastly, uh, the, the, uh, the head of the FBI opened his big mouth. And recently, uh, Foote just went into it. He accused, he and other law enforcement officials have had press conferences accusing Black Lives Matter for the murder of police officers. And, and I said, well, wait a minute. Now, what she's trying to say here, now let's be careful. And he, oh, well, y'all created to have to let this man his mouth talking about that. I'm with you, I'm not gonna say what I really feel. <laughs> the point is, here's the point. They done went and put, they put him out because this this big, that's, I, I can say that out. <laughs> from, from Illinois, winds up that he killed himself. Hi. He's a, mm -hmm. a bleeping thief. Mm -hmm. Robbing the, the, kid, the money from the kids, mm -hmm. this wonderful police officer. And he actually set his own murder, he set up his suicide to look like somebody had killed him. It's time to get your hands moving on this one. We, we need to, sometimes when the enemy drops something in your lap, don't sleep on it. Take it and just shove it right where the sun don't shine. So they, they occasionally give us things to work with. Let's use them. By, oh, by the way, there's also an Amnesty International uh, petition <laughs> Uh, on Kevin's case, uh, and we'd love to have people sign that. It doesn't cost you anything to go on and sign it. Mm -hmm. Front page of the website. Yeah. Tom? Uh, oh, oh, I got the man in the back. Oh, sorry. I, I just stood out in front of San Quentin and probably that to every vigil except for two since the death penalty was re implemented, uh, reinstated. Uh, the question that um, that Kevin raised in his phone call, because I think the thing that in part stalled out the death penalty was not having the compounds that was legally acceptable to use. And I believe I just heard him say that the state is going to make their own concoction. Correct. <coughs> Which means that, you know, uh, I think what he's saying is that they're going to open up the whole spectrum of killing folks again. Yes. In a real way. Oh, yeah. And I think that, you know, beyond Kevin, I think that it's a, a potent argument to present to the general public yeah, that you don't have uh, a death row. You got, what, 700? 750. 750. In California? 
in yep. California. There's no road in San Quentin that can hold 750. Wow. That's a whole goddamn block. Uh, so it ain't no death row concept anymore. That shit's out the window. Uh, so like, how do we actually start publicizing information uh, that the compounds that they get ready to use is going to be uh, made by the state, uh, and they're going to use that to, to actually implement killing massive numbers of people, which I think is a good argument to make in the public about why they should get involved against the death penalty, because I think that shit is mass murder. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. Um, I think the lady in brown, and then maybe we can interject Tom after that. I, I've been to San Quentin, um, and I've sat with the No More Tears. It's a group that called No More Tears. And um, just being a victim survivor, just, um, you know, how to see people go through transition in lives. Nobody's perfect, you know, so I've been working with a lot of inmates, and I'm actually looking for, I tried to get in touch with the Innocence Program for another person that's been in prison for 26 plus years. Um, he's looking for an attorney to send his information to because he was actually framed on Oakland Police Department too. But just to piggyback off what she was saying about a lot of uh, the people, uh, African-American males still in the community, still being profiled and you know harassed and interrogated and incarcerated from you know these polices. You know, when does it stop? This young man here was sitting, sitting in the passenger seat of his mother's car waiting to take his brother to the hospital. Police drove up, parked next to the car, he could pass it around, snatched him out, handcuffed him, and beat him. They fabricated, fabricated police reports on what had happened, and had it not been for the pictures and the witnesses, this young man would be in prison also from the way the police wrote the reports up. So when does it stop, you know? Just looking at how you know, an officer with a badge and a, and a gun can just do whatever they want to do and then people's lives are, you know, taken away from them, sitting behind jail, or some of them are even murdered. You know, when does it stop? So that's why I'm here today. I don't know if any of you get the court news, courthouse news services newspaper, but this article came up, um, it, it was written in October, but it came up this week. I got the article and this person was actually my son. Um, cops will face mom's distress claim and son's beating. I watched them beat my son. And had it not been for the police on top of my son's doing what they did to him, you know, it's really unexplained. I can't even explain it, you know? I can't even explain it. Um, you're you Catherine. Stop. You're Catherine, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, I hope somebody will be able to help her. Um, with some of the things that she was talking about. Um, next up, we have Tom. Uh, uh, Linda and I both serve on the board of directors for Death Penalty Focus. If any of you have heard about that, it's one of the major uh, abolitionist groups in the country, headquartered here in San Francisco. And we were one of the co-sponsors uh, four years ago uh, with Prop 37. And if you didn't follow that very closely, when that proposition went on the ballot, when it was approved, there was roughly a 30% gap between those in favor of the death penalty, 60% or so, versus those who were against it, which was 30% or so. After the election, the, the results of that election closed that gap to 2%. 2%. Because of that, death penalty focus has been studying whether or not to, to initiate that uh, initiative or something similar to it again. We are very, very close to uh, making the decision to move ahead. And uh, it's been publicized recently that the committee, separate committee that has been set up to, uh, to really investigate that and get it moving, headed by Mike Farrell, who used to be the former president of uh, Mike has actually submitted proposed language and announced the intention uh, to have the Attorney General approve the language for the initiative, and that's the next step that has to happen. But I wanted to use this to follow up on what Rebecca said. People are looking for things that they can do that, that would help Kevin. Uh, is 
once that gets approved, assuming that it does, we have to go through the petition signing process again. And uh, I think we have to collect something like three or 400,000 signatures this time. 365,000. But when that happens, we need every body person in this state that can do so to not only sign the petition, but get out and pass it around and get their friends to sign it. Uh, we, we were required to have 500,000 last time. We got over 800,000, so the people are out there. But that's one of the things you can do to help. And we can't wait for that to help Kevin. We've got to obviously move ahead with other things, but uh, just another another uh, thing you can look at doing to help the whole process here. Um, I think there was also a question earlier to you, Tom, about um, what's going on with the San Bernardino Sheriff's Department. <laughs> Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, I can. Um, Kevin mentioned my background in the FBI. I spent 25 years in the FBI. I was the uh, assistant agent in charge of deputy chief in Los Angeles. Well, the FBI in Los Angeles covered San Bernardino County. And I can tell you over a period of about a decade, we put away police officers, we put away judges, we put away <coughs> some county supervisors, all for different types of corruption. I mean, that county is at that time, and really hasn't changed very much, is an absolute cesspool that hasn't changed. And uh, in terms of, of what's going on out there, the current district attorney, Ramos, is every bit as rabid as was the district attorney back at the time of Kevin's trial. In fact, Ramos is one of the people leading a, a counter offensive. Uh, they are trying to get a petition to speed up the death penalty. And it's in roughly the same location where the death penalty <coughs> this, uh, 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 project is. But to answer your question, I have tried to interview any number of former and current San Bernardino County Sheriff's deputies. And to, be, to a person, to a person, they've refused to even have any discussion with them. And to me, that is continued corruption. These were sworn law enforcement officers, sworn to uphold the law, and they don't want to have anything to do with it. So that's the status of affairs. Thanks. Um, I just wanted to clarify that we're going to go through people who haven't spoken yet, and then if you spoke it right, we'll get you on the second round. Oh, Rebecca, you want to do it? Um, question, Tom. I haven't read the language in this, this initiative, but rumor has it that it's very passionately in support of LWAP. And I just want to make it very clear that that's not something that I support and that's not something that Kevin. Oh, can, can we talk later? Yeah. Okay. 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 Um, next up is Stan. Yeah. Um, I like to piggyback back on the first question some time ago. Uh, I know you know, people don't want to disparage the dead and all that, but the victim's family uh, in every uh, cop movie or detective novel there's always at least some investigation of who they were. Mm -hmm. And so, could you elaborate on that? Richard spoke, or Richard, or maybe it was you, uh, Mr. Howe, spoke earlier about it seemed to be a murder that was obviously not about money, not because credit cards are there, cash was left, et cetera, et cetera. It seemed to be wanting to send a message. Uh, and of course, it had to be a group doing it because as you pointed out, the. Uh, the man that was killed was probably pretty physically fit, and that one individual couldn't have done it. Uh, but what do you know about the the family? I mean, has there been an investigation of what the fa what did they do for a living? What were their ties? Richard alluded to the fact there was a lot of outright fascist groups in San Bernardino County. Uh, throughout the last 30 years, uh, white supremacist and fascists have a way of settling their internal differences by killing each other. Uh, okay. And so I wondered if we're doing ties with the ultra right or crime or both or whatever. Uh, we have not been able to uncover anything that suggests why the Ryans were murdered. Um, though, though there are a lot of, uh, we've gotten a lot of leads, a lot of anonymous calls, a lot of theories, a lot of things like that. But there's nothing that I can report that says that this or that at this point, it, it was why they were murdered. In fact, one of the anonymous, uh, two or three anonymous calls that I got were that they, whoever did this was uh, hit the wrong house. Yeah. They were supposed to kill somebody else 
and uh, they went to the wrong place. Mm. Um, you know, I'm actually noticing people starting to yell. I mean, maybe we could take a few more questions and then you know we'll call it a day and break and mix and all of that. Um, the, there was a question from a woman in the blue shirt. Um, you. I was just wondering how we can get that film. The. Uh, the uh, well, Death Row Stories, uh, that's the, the episode. Uh, I think it, it's been on YouTube. Uh, and if you also go to the Death Row Stories website, there is a website for Death Row Stories. It used to be on there. I haven't looked at it recently. But it, 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 it's posted somewhere on the internet. And Murder on the Mountain, you'll be able to find it. Thank you. Okay. And then uh, the last question for the woman in the red Thank you. I was just curious if you actually spoke to Governor Brown about this. And, you know, since obviously he's supported Prop 34, he wasn't very outspoken about it, but he voted for it. And so just wondering um, if, if you've actually had a conversation with him about this case. I can't answer that question. Okay. I, actually, I actually have a very important question. I'm okay. sorry. I know that was the last question. Um, so, this whole entire panel and everything we've discussed is premised on the idea of innocence. And personally for me, I don't give a shit if a person is innocent or guilty. It's like, you, you just, you don't kill a person. Yeah. Right. So, how do we, how do we change, sorry, Dorothy. How do, we change, how do we change that paradigm into thinking that only guilty people deserve to die? Or, you know, like, how do we change the paradigm to, to thinking that nobody, nobody gets killed, that you shut down the death house for everybody. Like, I, I, I feel that that's very critical it is. It is. In, in, in just it is. In, saving, in saving lives. It's going to take all of us to do that. You know, it's going to take every single person in this room to do that. Hey, I think I'd be crazy not to say this as a, a statement. I know you want to get up out of here. <laughs> but, you know, if I think she had a real valid question. You were in the middle of a real social struggle about if black people's lives actually matter. You're getting ready to get into the 2016 election. You're getting ready to have Hillary Clinton skip through our goddamn neighborhoods. Will she be able to walk through that neighborhood and not be challenged based on the policies of her and her husband? So I think at this particular point, we probably should be thinking about strategies on how to force a national question about the use of the death penalty if we're going to ever have a shot at actually doing something much more comprehensive because they scheduled to kill a whole bunch of folks. So like I can just be crazy if you just step out of this room and think that uh, the death penalty is about one individual as opposed to the murders of massive numbers of black people. You know, it's, no, it's not even about 750. They're killing people on a regular basis in Texas. They're killing people on a regular basis in, in, in a number of different other states. Yeah. So if we just limit it to just, and I want to see Kevin free too, but I want him to stop killing black people like it ain't shit, like it don't matter. So it's like, I would hate for us to leave this room and think about Bill just to get to skip through and his wife get to skip through and say, oh my bad, uh, and we don't do nothing about challenging that question about the habeas and that terrorism shit that he implemented. Because this is the time to actually start doing some of that work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It looks like we have a really urgent question from the back of this. I just I want, to, want to respond to Dorsey's comment. Um, I want to say two really quick things. Number one, California's death row is so fucking huge compared to everybody else's. Twelve states now have ended the death penalty in recent years. If California can end the death penalty, then I think it's over for this entire country. And that's what we need to focus on when the, if in fact this, this thing does make it onto the ballot. And the uh, other one I was, was going to say is there's another guy, and I'm not advocating for him because I have made my mind. There's another guy running for the Democratic nomination, and that's Martin O'Malley, who did end the death penalty in his state of Maryland. Right, thank you very much. Um, like Amir was saying, you know, I hope you all like mix after this. You know, find someone that you haven't uh, been introduced to before, and you know, find a way to work together and make something happen together. Thank you so much. Everybody.